Taylor, and we welcome you to the 11th annual uh, Conference on Stigma. And today we are excited to be here with some wonderful people, but it would not be happening without Christ Jesus. So today we're excited. This particular documentary you're getting ready to see, or conversation, is with two pastors and an advocate in a rural community. Well, it's not so rural, but it's Athens, Georgia. And when the University of Georgia is, go dogs, sick them, roof, roof. But we are excited. But the conversation started um, about stigma in the church, and it it based on August the 30th, which is known as National Faith HIV AIDS Awareness Day. RAHMA and its partners led the planning for National Faith HIV AIDS Awareness Day. The observance is intended to engage faith communities to work together for HIV AIDS education, prevention, treatment, care, and support, and to reduce and eliminate stigma and discrimination. I decided to have a discussion with two wonderful pastors who, if you combine their years of ministry, you're looking at good over 60 years together. And then I brought in an advocate who's had 25 years of experience and I'll give their bios later, but this conversation was definitely true and it was very dear to me. As a leader, as a faith leader of 20 years, I felt it was time that we brought the big guns in to have a wonderful and intent conversation. So if you would sit back, be attentive, and listen to what this particular conversation has entitled The Truth About Faith and HIV. Thank you. Dignity on my left will be Pastor Blussaw. Middle will be Mrs. Katie King. And last, my very own Pastor Isaiah Ellison. Thank you. Can we introduce ourselves starting with the Pastor Blussaw? Yes, I am uh, Reverend Darrell Bloodsall, pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church West. Uh, so excited to be a part of this discussion uh, on this day. Uh, there are so many other conversations like this that, uh, that not just need to happen, but must happen. Uh, I have uh, worked uh, for several years uh, alongside uh, with ministries that have sought to, uh, to address the disparities uh, and not just the attention that is given to the AIDS epidemic that continues in our community, but also the funding sources and the information that is so sorely needed. So just uh, uh, thankful uh, to be a part of the discussion today and look forward to learning uh, as, uh, as we will all learn uh, over the next hour. Ms. Tammy. My name is Tammy. Thank you. This is a great day. This is a day that as I come and sit with the pastors, we are discussing the HIV and what it looks like in the rural communities. And this is a major conversation that has to be talked about. Because when we talk about HIV, when we talk about stigma, when we talk about discrimination, we have to talk about the church because people are looking for support. And as African American people, we always look to the church for support. So this is going to be a great day for this conversation with this one of the pastors. Hello, my name is Reverend Isaiah Ellison. I'm the pastor of Summer Hill Baptist Church. I'm also the co-owner, not co-owner, I'm the founder of Feed My Sheep Incorporated, which is a nonprofit that provides assistance in the form of meals, education, monetary assistance, clothing, food to people in our community. <clears throat> uh, we are located in the uh, poorest section of the city of Athens, the Netherby area, uh, where poverty in that uh, area there is about 30% uh, poverty rate. Uh, we see cases of HIV, alcoholism, mental illness, and poverty, homelessness, all concentrated right there in that same area. And we are, uh, our mission is to follow the mission that Christ gave to Peter. If you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my sheep. So uh, I'm glad, I'm a, a, a really is happy to be a part of a, this uh, a foundation. I'm also on the board, I'm the chairman of the uh, Foundation of Living Board. Uh, 
interim temporarily uh, until we find someone to fill that position. Uh, I'm, uh, I've, I've been educated uh, from what I've learned through the foundation for me, of the urgency of now. Uh, I was unaware of the stigma. Pastor, I'm going too far. Come on now. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but I, I'm just happy to be a part of this, and 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 I'm just just so happy that we're having this discussion, and I look forward to future discussions as well. And you have certified peer specialist, HIV, HCV health educated tester. Um, you advocate for disorder, sexual wellness, domestic domestic violence, trauma, informed care. With this information, with this experience behind you. This is the question. How can the church walk with you as an advocate for the HIV community, not only the HIV community, but as we have drug abuse, uh, domestic violence, all the things that populate our community, what can the church do to assist you in that? And that is a very, very good question. As an advocate, and I've been in this field over 25 years in the HIV, substance abuse, and domestic violence, has impacted my life personally um, on so many different levels. And as the African American community, we're always looking for a place where we can get that ultimate support, and it's always the church. And I understand that a lot of churches are not educated, and they're fearful of learning the ins, the outs, the do's, the don'ts, what it looks like when it comes to HIV and hepatitis C or substance abuse. But when we're looking for support and how the church can help the advocates such as myself, let us come into the church. Let us do an advocacy training on what HIV looks like. Let us talk about stigma in the church with people who are diagnosed with HIV. Because people, people in all these different arenas, whether it's HIV, hepatitis C, domestic violence, we love God. And as African American people, we reach out to the church. And a lot of times the church closes the door because people who are diagnosed with HIV, they're always connected with sex. And that's a bad thing in the church on so many different levels, especially if you're not married. So, but my thing is let advocates come into the church, have that conversation with the leaders in the church bring education to the church and resources. That plays a major part in helping bring awareness to the churches regarding HIV, especially in the rural areas. Anybody want to tackle that? When it comes to the church and, and being open to allow programming, you being a pastor, you being a pastor, why do you think sometimes it's difficult? And it's going to lead into the next question, but how can we come together or is it even possible to break us off a little piece of training and resources? Pastor Bloodsaw. It is a, um, uh, what I'd call is a, it's a, a, a mini splendor thing. Mini splendor. Uh, mini splendor. Yes, yes. Uh, not to justify anything, but, but to understand uh, that, uh, as, as has been said, you know, there's, there's so much tradition uh, that gets caught up and, uh, and those traditions become blockers to us in many ways. Blockers uh, to us actually doing what it is we're called to do as the church. Uh, all too often, uh, uh, well, one of the lessons, one of the great lessons I believe that we are learning in the church now is that God has closed the doors. N not COVID-19, <laughs> not Donald Trump, man. <laughs> God has closed the doors to push us out of our comfort zone because the church has become these four walls and the roof. And so being in a, uh, in, in a place of discomfort and a place where, uh, where, where we have, we've become strangers outside of the church, we're good inside or so we thought. It is time now for us in this space when we are outside of the church to really uh, 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 reconnect with the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. Go ye therefore. Amen. Not, not stay, not hang out in the church, in the building. Mm -mm. Go ye therefore. Go. 
Mm. And so, uh, so that, that's one aspect. Additionally, we move into areas where uh, 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 we're, we're asking people to confront some ghosts mm. in the church. Everybody's got ghosts. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it, it, it has over time just become a very comfortable place to be inside the church because I don't have to deal with what's out there. And I can hide the rest of the time. No, you can't hide. Uh, that's why, you know, I'm, I, I'm, you know, some people come to church and they sit all pristine and proper, you know, mm -hmm. don't want to sweat in there in their three-piece suit. You know why? Mm -hmm. Because we're afraid. Yes. We're afraid of what is inside. We don't want to look at, we don't want to be a part of it. Um, uh, I believe it was uh, uh, Dr. Um, Calvin, that Reverend Dr. Uh, Gardner Taylor, Gardner Calvin Taylor, who said that as Christians, as believers, it is impossible or it ought to be impossible for us to be in the midst of another suffering and not suffer. It ought to be impossible for us to be in the midst of the trouble of someone else and not be troubled ourselves. We have to become troublers of Israel. Troublers and making people uncomfortable where we've gotten comfortable. And so, so again, there, there's so many, and, and if I could take one more, one more hot minute right here. Um, uh, Paul's letter to the church at Rome, uh, uh, at the end of chapter one, and this is, this is going to get to what Sister King was talking about. Uh, 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 in verse 18, where Paul talks about things of immorality and homosexuality. There is an and between those two words. Um, uh, uh, and we could have a whole other discussion about what Paul was really talking about. In the, in the Greek, it's talked about pederasty, not homosexuality. That's a different conversation. But we in the church make it homosexuality. And when we connect what we see as immorality to sexual behavior, it's also connected to AIDS. Mm -hmm. And so anybody and everybody who has AIDS, because they become anathema. You're dirty, you're bad. Well, not all AIDS comes from oh, sir. sexual oh, behavior. Man. Right. Oh, Arthur Ashe, great Afro-American, died of AIDS from a blood transfusion. Amen. But as long as we paint this disease with one broad brush, we'll always fall down on our duty, our responsibility. Now back to uh, uh, Romans chapter 1. Verse 18, even if we were to put it into this one big bucket of homosexuality, which it's not, Paul has a list in chapter eight, in chapter one, beginning at verse 18, of all of these things that he says are worthy of death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gossiping is mm -hmm. one of those, mm -hmm. worthy of death. Mm -hmm. Out of all of those sins, as Paul puts it, they're all worthy of death. He does not list them in an order of priority. He does not list them that say this is worse than that, this is big and that's small. He doesn't do that. They're all worthy of death. And therefore, it leads to God's grace and God's mercy for all of us and therefore for us to look at anybody because of a disease and say that that person is not worthy, it simply means not only are we judging someone, Amen. but it also means that we don't have a proper understanding of who and what Christ requires us to be. Okay, I'm done. Lord Jesus with the human enrichment. Yes. My question to you, do you think we know we're in this world, but we know we're not of the world. The question is, why is it so pivotal that we take the word of God and place it on these items that you are working for? Why is the word important when it comes to financial literacy? Why is the word important when it comes to tutorial education ability? Tell me as a director of a nonprofit, why is it so important to bring the word into the world? It is extremely important because all the things, all the services you mentioned that we provide are services that uh, 
the book of Malachi tell us that the church should be provided. When Malachi told the people, bring ye all the tithes to the storehouse so that there may be meat in my house, says the Lord. What is the meat? The meat is all of the assistance, all the service. The, the church should be able to provide everything all of our parishioners need. Food, medicine, shelter, clothing, information, assistance should all be provided in the church. You mentioned earlier, the nonprofits really should be an arm of the church. We create nonprofits just to get around the difficulty of taking everything that we want to do to a board and sitting waiting for somebody to make a decision when folk are hungry and starving out there. While we try to decide whether to feed somebody, folk are starving. So, so, so the, the nonprofit allows us to just go to and take care of a situation immediately. So, yes, um, I, I created the nonprofit for feeding, uh, feeding my sheep after going to Kenya, Africa and seeing the poverty and the destruction there. And when I got back here, God put it on my heart to create this nonprofit, Feed My Sheep. Because when he asked Peter, uh, do you love me? If the church really, now when I say church, I mean the people of the church. We love, we, we love God's people, but not just the way we want to love them the way we want to love them. We don't love them the way Jesus says we should love each other. So in the, and that's why I asked Peter three times, do you love me? Yes. Do you love me, Peter? Are you, are you sure you love me? Then feed my sheep. What, not just some of the sheep, all of the sheep, the sick sheep, the sheep, the liars, the drug addicts, the mentally ill, the HIV, the homosexuals, all of my sheep. Feed them. Amen. And that's what we as a church should be doing. Amen. I could continue. Okay. Yes, <laughs> Can I? He's getting me excited. Um, uh, I, I'd like to add to Malachi, Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus lists some categorical imperatives. Doesn't matter how you look at it, Jesus is inclusive and not exclusive. Amen. When Jesus says, uh, uh, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. My, my. Mm. When I was sick, you didn't visit me. Mm. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. These are categorical imperatives, which means there's no other way to see it. It's categorical. It's up and down. It's black and white. As you have not done these things to me, mm. you have not done them. Man. And I think I'm going to add something. Well, well, I want you to add. It's going to go exactly what you're saying. Okay. All of these elements and disparities in the communities, how does it affect HIV? Powerful. That's a good question. Because we're looking at so many different barriers. And remember when I said that African American people, we look to the church for our support. Because we are spiritual beings. And when the church closes the door, it damages us mentally, physically, and spiritually. We become lost individuals. That means that we may not take care of ourselves. When you suffer trauma, when you suffer neglect spiritually, that's a burden in itself with the person, any person, but with the person that is diagnosed with HIV. Because one thing I have learned in this industry, education and getting tested must be a priority. It has to be joining the advocates with the church. This is an urgency and a cry and a priority for all people to get education, to get tested. If there is a diagnosis, a person has a choice of starting treatment. People are not dying from HIV anymore. In the early years, doctors were telling individuals, you have six months, you have five years, you have three months. That is not so. Medications have developed over the years and people that are diagnosed with HIV are living a healthy, productive life. But we're still dealing with some issues in the South. 
One of the issues, number one, in my point of view, when you call the South, the Deep South, that's stigmatizing right there in itself. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the Deep South in HIV, number one. Number two, the other barriers, when you go to the doctor's office, some doctor's office really don't even have the right type of communication. Some people who are diagnosed with HIV, you got to pull a number, you consider it as a number instead of a person first. And then I've had conversations with people where they have to go into the side door. And then you have to sit over here and wait. And everybody knows that the people sit over here is HIV positive. And that stigma in itself, and it, it can become eternal stigma. All this that we're all talking about, and who we bring in the church, if the church is not operating on loving everybody equally, then that is a significant problem, especially when people that are diagnosed with HIV is looking for somebody in the church to go to and say, hey, can I talk to you? I have something on my mind, Pastor. Or Sister Mary, I need to talk to someone. That's a major need for somebody who loves God. And we're looking at so many different barriers. We're looking at transportation in the rural area. I know ladies that are scuffling every day to get to the doctor in Atlanta. Stigma is going to always exist. But when stigma, stigma turns into eternal stigma, then that's a bigger issue. And then being adherent to medication so an individual can become viral suppressed. It is 456 people diagnosed in Clark County. Only half of those people are in care. That's a problem. So it's a barrier somewhere, and all of it goes back to trauma, stigma, and discrimination. And the people in the church who decide and make the decision that you're not wanted. Thank you. Here it is. First Baptist Church in Crown Heights in Brooklyn, New York, Dr. Bloodsaw leadership had an impact throughout the church and the community while several initiatives continued to shape the church of the ministry in the 21st century. Dr. Bloodsaw's background includes a religious and corporate civic academic arenas deeply committed to strengthening and empowering the black church and the black family is socially conscious hope-filled and spirit-led teaching and preaching seeks to inspire the least of these, to live up, to live up to, and to live out God's promise of a future with hope. My question with that, coming to members of I believe you are more open to discuss your passion with HIV. You took the position here in the South. What is the difference? What is the mentality? What is the motivation that you see that it could be fine or it could be different? What do you see as a difference from the north to the south when it comes to prevention and workshop and strengthening the, the, total, the total black family? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll say this, um, specifically where the church is concerned. Church folk are church folk. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we is us is, uh, no matter where we live. Um, <laughs> But I will, I, I will agree with you that um, uh, the openness and the willingness to have the discussion is, is, is easier there than here. Uh, 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 and, and again, it is, it, I don't want to put it all on geography. But, but this, is, this is still considered the Bible Belt, mm -hmm. you know, whereas uh, New York uh, and, and throughout the North, things are considered to be more liberal. Mm -hmm. um, where I see that the lines connect, though, is that, you know, uh, as the, in the black church, the black community, we are not registered Republicans but we are conservatives. Mm -hmm. okay. Historically, the black community and black people are conservative, more so than whites. Meaning, our tolerance for things mm -hmm. that we don't necessarily ascribe to is very low. 
homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Ah, and anything connected to homosexuality. It's not just homosexuality, but we will, that's one of those things in our community that, well, we don't do that. Come on, dog. I mean, have you, have, you know, I mean, it's, homosexuals are in the church now, just like homosexuals have always been in the always. church. It's simply, it used to be, you couldn't say it, but they came and they suffered in silence. Now, gradually, baby steps, not, not giant steps, but baby steps, I think the church is blossoming and opening up because essentially, and, and this, this ties into what Sister King was saying a second ago, uh, we are, uh, we take the same oppression that has been leveled against black folk and we recycle it to put it on other folk. Even ourselves. We recan, we, we, we bottle up the oppression that has been put against us, meaning just like we have been pushed out, we want to push people who are HIV positive out. Oh, just like we have been looked down Amen. upon, we want to look down mm -hmm. upon people who are HIV positive. Mm -hmm. We can't do that. There, there are some real issues. The more and more we bury our heads in the sand, mm -hmm. not only do we get more and more unlike Christ, mm -hmm. but we also prolong and we pronounce that which is wrong. Yes. We become that which we abhor. Mm -hmm. So it is, and so back to the, the difference between the North and the South, you know, the South lags in terms of a liberal mindedness that is required, mm -hmm. particularly in this faith, this faith, this faith that we have. Faith requires that we believe. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and just to put a little more Bible on it, because I like the Bible, it's yes, a good book. Yes, yes, I'm yes. to spend a little more time with, yes, that, yes, with yes. that book, the Bible. Yes, Lord. But at the end of chapter one in the Gospel of Mark, a man with leprosy approaches Jesus. And what we have done in cutifying the scriptures is that things like the King James Version will say, moved with compassion, Jesus did this and so. The Greek does not say that Jesus would move with compassion. Basically, Jesus felt sorry for him, so Jesus healed him. No, 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 no. The word in Greek translates not to compassion, but mm -hmm. anger. Mm -hmm. There's a great difference between mm -hmm. compassion and anger. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, why would Jesus be angry? And that's what people, you know, come to church on Sunday morning, and Jesus is walk, walking around to theme music like Shaft. No, it ain't a silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. No, 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 no. Jesus, the Greek says he was moved with anger. He wasn't angry with the man with leprosy for approaching him. He was angry with the conditions that were placed upon this man, pushing him outside of the city. He has to walk around in clothing that says that I am a leper. His hair had to be disheveled. He had to wave his arms and say, leper, leper, leper. Jesus was angry because of the way that this man had been treated. Yes, 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 yes. And so when we move, when we too are moved, with anger and indignation at the way that some of our brothers and sisters because of a health condition mm. are treated. Mm. We ought to be moved out of our own comfort zone yes, yes, mm. yes. and fight for the least of these. Mm. Amen. I tell you right now, some of your brothers and sisters <clears throat> will probably be deleting you from <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> but one thing I can say, God made no mistakes when he asked his parents. And he, he saw us. And Ted, I have to apologize to you. I'm trying to pick everybody else but you. But because of what's in you, God had your name in that seat. Pastor F, here is what Pastor Butts always says. And when he said move the indignation, that is the new buzzword that is coming. When you walk into your neighborhood, when you have to feed again, and it's the same people that is repetitive coming to your center, what is moving you? What is making you angry that you're by yourself? Hmm. Why do you have to be the only one in your center group? 
Why foundations got to be the only one? Why cannot we join with other organizations that is just as passionate as we are? But when it comes to conferences and midnight church uh, and the choir anniversaries, everybody and their dog want to come. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to boots on the ground, why can't we be angry about the conditions of our people? First, let me, let me say that all of us, us as church and church folk, have uh, skeletons in our closets. We have folk in our family who have AIDS. Church folk are not, on, on, on immune to that. But we do with that that we do with, with uh, everything else. Our dirty laundry, we hide it. So other people won't know. And we and we can walk out of our door with pride, thinking that nobody knows that uh, 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 I'm going through the same thing with what they're going. My sin is different from that sin. But knowledge is power. Education is the key. Jesus' whole mission was to show us how to love from the gentleman with leprosy, the woman with the issue of blood, the man at the pool at Bethesda, to the prostitute that he met and wrote in the ground and said, whoever who among you without sin cast the first stone. We have to look at these examples as a guide to help us throw off our, the cover and expose those things that we are maybe ashamed of. And when we get rid of that guilt, then we will be able to help others who we need. So when we are there and the same people coming this week who was hungry last week and we helped them and last month, the same people to come with clothes and need clothing again, that means that we still hadn't done our job. Because it's not the person that's the problem. It's what's causing the problem that we have to address. And so we can't get angry with the person who, who ain't need. They didn't create their need for situation. Many circumstances may attribute to that. And the church, pastors, leaders, our, and deacons, and, and all our officials must come together and address those underlying concerns that perpetual, keep our people in perpetual poverty, in perpetual ignorance, in perpetual fear. And to do that, we have to first love, learn to love, unselfishly, to love each other. And as Pastor said, we put some Bible on our emotions and our feelings every day when we get up. So when we see somebody in need, we won't blame them for their condition. We first look at ourselves. Am I contributing to the, 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 my brothers being in poverty on, on the east side? Am I contributing to the hunger? In, uh, uh, what, what can I do to help alleviate that? Should I give more to my church? First of all, I, should I give, am I giving my tithes and offerings? <laughs> the old song you said, if I can help somebody, as I pass on, then my little one, I'll be right. So we're closing up, and he started. He's already said his pastor. Fishermen. Yes. Instead of being a contributor to the issues of the elements of the minds, as a leader, he said that what can an advocate do? What person that may not be a pastor, but definitely is a leader? A leader of 25 years in the fight, what can people do who may not have a title but may have service. Mm -hmm. What can we do? We can join other advocates in this movement. Oh, cool. We can join other advocates in this movement. Pastor Blustow, when he made the statement about oppression, I believe as a community of black people as a whole, we have suffered so much trauma in our black community till we stop helping and loving one another. It's almost like if something happened down the street, I'm gonna close my blind. Instead of picking up the phone and calling and saying, hey, is everything all right? Is there anything that I can do? How can mm. I support you? 
Can I keep your children? Do you need to go to the doctor? Mm. Do you need any money? Do you need a ride to the store? Is your light bill paid? We have lost all connectedness with each other as black people in the community. Mm. And it is an urgency, not only with the church, people that are outside the church who are looking down on people with whatever diagnosis that they may have. But since we are talking about HIV, they don't know if that person is suffering. So what can advocates do? Or what can people do to help advocates? We need to come together. This is a community concern. This is not a single individual concern. If black America, and I have to say black America, if we cannot come together as people like they did in the olden days and help and support one another, then we're gonna continue to be a, a lost community. And people are going to be dying in silence, suffering in silence, because the next brother or sister then close the door and then pick up the phone. We gotta to come together for our community. Education and tested, t being tested, joining the church and other advocates. And we gotta come outside these walls. Thank you. Amen. That was a <laughs> um, this trauma, and, and, and it is trauma to be black in America, is trauma in and of itself. And I, I look forward to the time, to that day, when, when we won't do what we've, what we've become masters of mm -hmm. in re-traumatizing ourselves, uh, uh, but that we would reach a point where we will stop traumatizing ourselves mm -hmm. because other folk are not doing it as much mm -hmm. as we do it. So let us, let us find it within ourselves. And, and watch this, that can only be found in the church. Let me say it again, let me say it again. It can only be found in the church. The further we get away from the roots of who and what the black community is, my, my, my vision and I guess my definition of, of the black community comes back to the concept, the idea of the village where we used to know who our neighbors were, where you could borrow a cup of sugar, We've gotten too Eurocentric mm. Mm. and away. And that's not to say that being Eurocentric is bad for Europeans. No, 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 no. We're not Europeans. We're Africans. We're people Af of African Amen. descent. Amen. And therefore that concept, the idea of the village, mm. when we get closer and closer back to it, and I don't mean to glorify yesteryear, because I wouldn't want to go back there. My, my. Amen. Amen. But in the end, to be able to salvage those things where we were neighborly, the Bible teaches us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Jesus says in John, by this, they will know that you are my disciples. Yes, Amen. yes, yes. That you love one another. This love ethic. If we can itch day by day, year by year, closer and closer to that love ethic, mm -hmm. where we understand that we are not an end to ourselves, but we die because our brothers and sisters die. Amen. When Amen. they live, mm. we live. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. My name is Sandy Baker, Executive Director of Foundations for Living, and we're so glad that you joined us. The truth about faith and each other. Hey. Good afternoon. I'm Cynthia Gibson, a member of the International Conference on Stigma Planning Committee. At this time, I would like to invite you to join Reverend Sandy Bailey, the moderator for the Stigma Faith Group video and discussion. Reverend Bailey is the founder of a nonprofit titled Foundations for Living, providing strength and transformation to students, families, and communities 
through inspiration and education. The organization consults with local governments, educational systems, community-based organizations, and religious groups on human empowerment and professional enrichment with a biblical twist added to its curriculum. Raven Bailey also has certification by the National Council in Behavioral Health for Mental Health and she is a member of the Compass Initiative Community Partner. Her motto is, love isn't love until you give it away. Thank you, Reverend Sandy Bailey, for being the moderator of the Stigma Faith Group video and discussion. Ooh, what a conversation. Um, I can tell you when God put that in my spirit, I was very hesitant because that's a deep conversation. That's a taboo conversation. That's a conversation that preachers in the South do not want to have and they don't discuss. But when you truly know what God is pushing you to do, you have no choice. Well, you have a choice. You can do it or not. I chose to do it. And to have that panel, powerful panel, powerful panel of gifted intellectuals, spirit-filled people. We had Dr. Darrell Bloodsaw, who would, was not able to be here. In fact, he's actually in class finishing up his finals. But we do have my very own Pastor Isaiah Ellison, the pastor of Summer Hill Baptist Church. We also had that wonderful advocate, Mrs. Tammy Kenny of 25 years. And this afternoon, we have a beautiful sister, Dr. Sonia King, who is coming all the way from uh, Baltimore, Maryland. So today we have a beautiful uh, panel panel of professionals that love Christ, who's going to unpack that conversation even the more. So I'm going to ask all the attendees to unmute their buttons, their uh, mute buttons, and I'm going to introduce just a little bit and then I'll let y'all take it from there. But um, first, I want to introduce Tammy Kenny. Tammy, live, uh, Tammy lives in the state of Georgia. She's a certified peer specialist. And she's also an HIV health educator and tester. She is uh, a person that wants to just stop stigma and discrimination. Her awards are for Leading Women Social 2020, the Marvin Groom Leadership Award in 2018. And she has over 25 years of experience. It's more to her resume, but I can only write so much. Also, Pastor Isaiah Elton, uh, a lead pastor of the church that I attend and very excited about. Her. You muted yourself. Wow. I've been talking and I was on mute the whole time. Forget no, you weren't. Okay. But y'all can hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Pastor yes. Isaiah Ellison is the local pastor where I'm so glad to sit up under his leadership. He has over 30 years of preaching experience. He is also the director of two nonprofits. Uh, Feed My Sheep is one that we will discuss, which provides food distribution, drug abuse counseling, financial literacy, and so much more. He also has tutorial computer services there, but he's also a businessman. So we have to know you have to have the profits to do the passion. And he will discuss on that as well. And last but definitely not least, Dr. Reverend Sonia King. Again, she is currently under appointment in the Baltimore Washington Conference since 2005. She co-chairs the Criminal Justice and Mercy Ministry team of the Baltimore Washington Conference. What I love about her, and I just met her a couple of days, is that she said, saying I don't know too much about HIV, but what I know, God has called me to the least of these. Mm -hmm. And that's what's important to her. She has challenged her congregations to live their faith by becoming a haven of hope for those desiring to begin life again. I welcome some, introduce y'all, the panel that will take us on to the top of the hour. Can you give it up for our wonderful people? So what did y'all think about the video? We'll go there and then we'll go into something else. Start with you, Dr. King. What was your thoughts? Because that was the first time. Yeah, it was a lot. 
that was discussed was still a lot more that needs to be discussed. I think it was filled with tools, that, things that we need to talk about. But like I said, there's still more that needs to be discussed because there's still work that needs to be done. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very good. What about you, Pastor Ellison? Unmute, sir. There you go. Uh, the uh, video discussion was uh, uh, on point. As, uh, as a matter of fact, it's, uh, it's an issue that must and should be discussed uh, among faith-based organizations. We uh, can no longer put our heads in the sand and, and act like um, there's no need uh, in our communities uh, to embrace, to reach out uh, to brothers and sisters who are suffering. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's a wonderful beginning. Tammy, go ahead and put yourself off mute. You can't hear? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and ask a question while uh, St. Elmo is working with Tammy. First question, Dr. King, after viewing the video, what are some of the key points? Because you keep saying there's much, much more to be done. What is a key point that you think after that, what would be my strategy to move forward? You being a pastor, what would you see that you would do in your local congregation? Because one is better than none. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think I would connect with organizations in and around the church where I pastor um, to see what's being done and what still needs to be done. We do... Um, food giveaways and things like that. We do NA meetings and AA meetings, but um, so we talked about the stigma of having HIV and AIDS. That's not readily talked about. So I think what I would do is find out the need and the population that's in and around the community um, that's around the church so I can be of support to them. With you being United Methodist, y'all have a strategic plan of what you can and cannot do? Um, yes, and, and I think we're doing a good job right now. We, um, you know, affirm the responsibility of the church to minister with those that are affected with HIV and AIDS and their families. Um, we do a quality of life retreat three or four times a year. We've had um, the second one um, happens this weekend um, that's, that will be happening via Zoom, but it's usually a three or four day uh, retreat where there's uh, worship, there's um, keynote speakers, there's small group sessions and, you know, things like that. And it's in a place that um, is very welcoming and, you know, on a lake and cabins and things like that where they can just be free and you know enjoy nature and things like that so we do take the responsibility seriously about ministering to those living with hiv and aids in their families i applaud you i applaud you the question tammy was after viewing yes. i know you were a part of the actual the original conversation what yes. is a strategy or a tool that you would suggest being an advocate of 25 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. you see you see the the aftermath when they've been hurt in the church and they come to you, what would be a strategy? Because you're out there, what would you tell us? First of all, uh, I want to be clear this is not an isolated issue. And what I mean by that, this doesn't just concern the people who have um, the diagnosis, this is a community concern. And our faith leaders are involved in the community. Um, if not, should be. Um, it's, it's to show love, number one. Because a lot of times people that are diagnosed with HIV, they listen to the feel like they're uncomfortable because they have done something wrong. I think the education and the awareness 
for people who have a diagnosis and people who do not have a diagnosis to come together and sit together and have this conversation so that would decrease the stigma and discrimination if we can, as they say, put everybody up under the same roof gotcha. and talk about it because it also affects the family. Um, I have seen where an individual was in the family, the family was an educated, the family is in the church. Um, even though they know that one of their family members is diagnosed with HIV, it's a shh. Don't tell nobody else. But suppose you had to and you were in their position that you had to tell somebody who wanted to talk to somebody in the How would that person be accepted? Because as African Americans, and I'm comfortable now doing these virtual um, meetings saying black folk. They look for the church. They look for the church. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Pastor, I'm going to connect this comment, what Tammy said. Educate the, the entire family, bringing everybody to the table. As a pastor, we are good about giving the narrative, the three points and the conclusion that's what we do but how difficult is it if we can bring the entire scripture and make it plain to entire family meaning we can bring the health issues as well as the healing master to the table what can we do as a pastor to make sure that that conversation is given out from the pulpit speaking you dealing with people that are in disparities how can your message be tailored to include everybody so we can hear the same voice. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Unmute, Pastor. Unmute. Thank you. That does make sense. And many times as pastor individuals, our sermons are that we're we speaking to the person uh, because we're trying to reach uh, the person. So mm -hmm. as pastors, and this is something that, that, that we have to be mindful of, we sometimes, and this is going to require us to uh, uh, change uh, the way we uh, present and the way we deliver. Our business. Well, we are not, not, not necessarily only speaking to the individual, the person whom we are trying to, to, to reach and, and, and convert. We, uh, but, but our messages, where well, we're now speaking to the families uh, of those individuals as well who, who may feel um, uh, ashamed, uh, embarrassed, uh, reluctant uh, to come forward and talk about uh, those things that we know uh, are in the shadows um, of us and nobody, nobody know. There are other means we can address uh, that issue of of uh, the stigma showing love and the discrimination uh, as we educate the entire family uh, is to, uh, and I think Dr. King has, uh, has alluded to this, uh, we have programs such as Bible study and and, and shopping, those kind of things. Uh, but we can, we, we must create other means of ministering to families mm -hmm. uh, where we are not only just having Bible study, get together a family meal where we just get together and meet and greet and talk and love on mm -hmm. one another in love uh, uh, uh you know reciting a bunch of scriptures is one thing but living scriptures is something totally different so we have this condition the hi and people living with AIDS. we have to live what we preach and not take words to people, but now let, let them see us loving right. on them, you know, mm -hmm. in a family setting in the church. And if you, even if you never mention the scripture, it, it doesn't matter. You don't have to. You're right. living it. Right. You're showing it. Mm -hmm. And so that's another reason. I'm going to pull out this definition. The word is stick. A mark of disgrace or a stain or reproach. To me, it is the perception that you've given somebody else. It's not mm -hmm. me, but it's what I think of somebody else, what stigma comes in at. And that's what we're trying to acknowledge. Pastor yes. King, 
and using that word. Do you feel that we, and, and Dr. Futsal, he talked about it. We as black people are doing that are living with a disease, the same thing that another race has done to us. We are perceiving them to be less than. What can we do as people of faith to educate ourselves and to recognize that we are stigmatizing somebody? I think the first thing we can do is go back to the beginning when God created all of us in his own image and he said that we were all very good. Um, people need to know that everybody doesn't know that. And when you know that God created you and created you in his own image, you're very good. That should be enough, regardless of what anybody says to you or does to you. Um, so I think that's the first thing, helping people to understand who they are in God. And, and it's enough. It's, it's enough. It's simply enough. Um, and you know, as was alluded to in the video, we, us as church folk, we're good at stigmatizing people. And it's a shame because we should be the ones that should be loving on folk and treating um, everybody else the way God, you know, showed his love for us. Um, so I think it has to be learned. Um, you're no better than anybody else. God made us all and asked us to love everybody. He didn't say just love X, Y, and Z or this group, that group. He said love everybody. So I think it's something that we have to um, teach and remind people of all. We're all made in the image of God. And he said that we were very good. So um, it's, it's a difficult thing, but I think it's something that can be done when you treat people, when you teach people that you know better than anybody else. Like run into somebody that may be homeless, but that could be you a week, a month, or a year from now. So you don't look down on anybody because of that. Um, you know, you just try to help them and do what you can for them. So we can't be judgmental. Um, because the word says, judge ye not, or you shall be judged. Um, but I think it's something that we have to teach. We're no better than anybody else, and you can be in the same situation that they're in. But, but Tammy, I'm going to ask you a question. God. Thank you, Pastor. Tammy, my question for you is, for a advocate that's listening and watching it, and they're asking, how can I get into the church? What would you recommend them to do? And then we're going to ask the pastors what would they receive? Because we as advocates have our one, two, three, this is how we do it. But the pastors may have a, another method that they would want to be approached. What would that look like for you, Tammy? I think what it would look like for me, I'm just going to go ahead and use um, the church that I'm a part of without yeah, I think having an HIV ministry or a wellness ministry where we can educate not only the people in the church, but the leaders in the church. Mm -hmm. Going to the deacons, making a proposal, and talk about the need of what this would look like for the community. I know in Barrow County, it has been six, seven deaths due to um, an individual that had complications but were diagnosed with HIV. So Winder is a small town. And those deaths touched the lives of other people in the community. But then after for so long, everybody was back to the sh But going into the churches, especially in the South, the Bible Belt, is asking, can we come in and do a training? Mm -hmm. What would that look like? Mm -hmm. If we just do a training and have some of the leaders in the church participate. And just, That's you good. know, it's a wellness training, but add that because nobody woke up and said, 10 years later, I'm going to be diagnosed with HIV. 
what actually happened in your life before HIV. To be able to look at the whole wellness of an individual. Because we as black folks, a lot of us are broken from the core before diagnosis even came in. Tell me, I'm gonna get into that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up the word intersection. Whole where you going, okay? I won't Pastor. stop right now. <laughs> yes, I, I want to get to that. Pastor, if you have someone that is approaching you, they could be in the church because you're familiar. How what is the protocol for, for someone who wants to talk about this? What is the protocol for, for a pastor or for you and some of you? For someone who wanna talk about this? Well, who, someone who wants to be an advocate and we're getting ready to have World AIDS Day, which is December the 1st. Okay, okay, okay. How would you receive, if it's me, your, your daughter in ministry, what would be my what would be the way to go in and say, Pastor, I wanna have a Saturday event bringing mm -hmm. a speaker and we're going to talk about these particular diseases but we're going to focus on just education one-on-one -on -one. what would be okay. your response to that i would take that request um to the business meeting and uh present it to the um uh, to the uh uh the leaders of the church not that not the deacon board but the leader of the church and mm -hmm. uh, i i a stamp of approval on it and 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 that's important because when you when a pastor uh feels strongly that his church should be involved in something it's more than just a preaching or yes uh that you want them to your church to be involved in it but you put your stamp of approval i this is something i feel strongly that we should do so you put i put in it and put my stamp of approval on it. And now, let me this is of how I may do that. Uh, sometimes we have to correlate things and compare things. Um, and I use the coronavirus as one. Now, we can point fingers at our brothers and sisters with HIV. I see them dying from that and, and pretend that we don't care because it doesn't affect us, mm. but God is amazing. So he is us with this coronavirus that we cannot smell, be identified uh, in necessarily who have this condition. Let's look at the effects of this thing upon human life. Many similarities to that. Uh, anybody can catch you. Uh, necessarily have to get it from uh, your interaction with any mm -hmm. airborne virus. So, coronavirus, you get HIV. Mm -hmm. Talk about coronavirus. We need HIV. It's the, the, this thing that's dear, dear and dear to all of us, and we must we must learn to understand this virus for what it is. It's mm -hmm. it's some it's with us. It's going to be with us. It's not going anywhere. And the church, Jesus said, "Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it." The gates of hell is anything that is not in accordance with God's goodness and grace and mercy, but takes, and, and, and age is just one of those things. We have to embody these things for what they are and minister mm -hmm. who, who are most, are more in need of, of men. Our brothers and sisters who are, are those, those who are homeless. Mm-hmm this thing together and that's the about us. We, we can put the scriptures with that yet all have sin and fall short what is sin is everything that is not God. And, and it doesn't make us bad or wrong we're all sinners saved by grace that's the only difference so we, we have a duty to reach out and minister our brothers and present it and 
for the form of processes and put my staff approval on it when it's presented to make sure that it is uh, it takes place that it happens. Very good. Very good. You are right. Leadership has pastors and leadership have to approve it before the congregation. Will. That that's just the body and how it works. I wanted to use this word, and it's a word that is very much used in social work. Intersection. Intersection, domestic violence, poverty, undereducated, under income, if you can use that word, has played a part in the transmission of HIV. Do you agree or do you disagree? Tammy, and then I'm gonna let Dr. King deal with that as a pastor. What does she see when it comes to her parishioners? Tammy, the word intersection. I do agree because I understand now going through different trainings of what trauma looks like. Um, I've taken courses of what trauma looked like as a whole with all people and what it looks like in the black community. And a lot of times it has to do with keeping secret, uh, um, feeling like I'm not being loved and somebody may, or being, abuse, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, substance abuse in the home, or maybe not substance abuse in the home, but an individual met someone looking for love in all the places. It's a host of things can actually put a person at risk for HIV. When we talk about trauma, we talk about it on so many different levels and untreated trauma a person can develop a mental health issue. When we look at the intersection of that, when we look at that, we want to be able to treat the whole person, not only once the person receives a diagnosis, the people always focus, the healthcare arena, and I'm not knocking them, they are getting so much better and all better. How did you get? Nobody asked anybody what happened to you is always how did you get it um how many men did you sleep with or how many women did you sleep with oh did you use are you IV drugs but nobody took the time said ma'am sir what happened to you there was something already going on before the diagnosis that the majority of the people with the diagnosis been going through some stuff in their lives. Mm -hmm. This is just another part of a symptom or a disease that just happened. The person could have already been homeless for whatever reason that may be. A person may have had so much trauma in, in their lives, never received any type of help, played a part in a diagnosis of HIV. So we just can't say um, I had a one night stand, which it can happen. A person had a one night stand and contracted HIV. Um, we did a survey about seven years ago and one lady admitted, I probably slept with about 60 or 70 men. And we were like in a year, um, two years, she said probably in a month. She was not diagnosed with HIV, but a lady that was in a relationship, in love, first night. A month later, she became wow. ill with a cold-like symptom, diagnosed. So we just can't say having an initial diagnosis, you have multiple sex parts. Right. Right. That has been proven. Number one. Number two, blood transfusion. Everybody know about the Ryan White story, right? Um, and then in these intimate partner violence relationship, men and women are forced to have unprotected sex. But then if you're homeless and lost your job and your back is up against the road and you got yes. two to three children, maybe five, or a mother, her back is going to be up against the wall. Because I got to feed my babies right. and I got to pay rent. So we're looking at that, that, that economic, that, um, um, their financial need. So it's so many different things that intersect with having a diagnosis of HIV. That's why we got to talk about trauma. We got to look at the whole person. 
mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially. We got to do whole hell. Tammy, very good. Thank you so much for that. Dr. King, being a pastor, yeah. Yeah. United Methodist, oh. with what she just said, as a pastor, and we know we have a lot of members, but we don't necessarily go home with them. So we don't know what they're dealing with. But when they bring it to your front door, as a pastor, do you have the means in your church to address those issues? And if you don't, are you open to deal with it or bring in the resources with imperfection? I don't necessarily have the means I can assess, um, but I would have to reach out for some other resources to help them. And yes, I agree with the whole intersectionality piece. Um, and this coronavirus adds a whole nother level to it. Yes. With this social isolation. Um, our church is not open um, right now for worship but we've opened it back up to the NA groups and the AA groups because we had some suicides in our community. And I can't, you know, sleep with that. Um, so I said, we have to tell the trustees, we have to do what we need to do to mark off six feet apart so these groups can come in and yeah. fellowship and get what they need so that nobody else is out there killing themselves. So mm -hmm. we may not have the resources at the church but I would be willing to reach out and find out what needed to be done to help that individual. And if Fair. somebody came, going back to your previous question, if somebody came to me and said, hey, I want this to happen, I said, come on, how can I support you in getting it done? That's it, because that's people, it. people need to be aware. Um, too many people mm -hmm. you know, have a roof over their head and think everything's fine in the community, but it's not. And if I can't have a roof over my head and I don't have food to eat, then you should feel the same way. You know, we can't rest until we're all at peace and we're all whole. So, so yeah. I often have a saying, Jesus fed them before he fed them. Yes, I'm yeah. I'm not going to listen to you preach if I'm hungry. Exactly. I, I, I can't even function. I, I can't even, my mind won't even settle enough because I'm hearing the rumble of my stomach. Absolutely. So Absolutely. what you've said is crucial when it comes to the holistic body. Absolutely. When we talk about holistic bodies and being staying in our lane, but having enough sense to go outside our lane to put somebody to help us walk this out. Yep. When it comes to people coming out of jail. Mm. That's the Ellison. I know this is a passion of yours because this is something that you do at Feed My Sheep. You have you have people that are boots on the ground. What can pastors do? And I, I'm strictly dealing with faith leaders. I've been this, in this thing for 20 years. And some pastors, I will go back to their congregation. Some I won't even pick up the phone because some ignorance is just some ignorance is just crazy. To me. But people coming out of jail needing transportation, needing job skills. How crucial is it for the, the nucleus of the, new, the neighborhood to be a part of that transition? And I'm mute, because I want to hear what you got to say. Thank you so very much. It is extremely important uh, that we uh, have resources um, available to us. Many churches, uh, don't have um, small churches, don't have access to a lot of in-house resources, but there's a lot of resources outside of the church that we can tap into and, and, and use. One of the things that we do is that we work with all the services groups that we are aware of that provide assistance to uh, persons in jail and those who are coming out to a minute of uh, the prison ministry program. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, we work with Ebenezer, uh, one of our sister churches, who have a, a prison ministry program. And we follow up with, uh, with prisoners who are on the way, who are in, not only there, but on the way out. When they get out, then we are ready to know what they what they We give them uh, information on social service programs that they can contact for clothing, uh, uh, for, for jobs who are... Um, uh, favorable 
go to uh, people who may have felonies who have hired them. We know we know what those uh, what those employment are. Uh, uh, financial assistance. We uh, counsel family members as uh, as they work their way back into the community. Uh, we have a drug treatment program there at our church as well that meets three days a week, um, where they can uh, uh, can can come uh, to. Uh, if a drug is a, abuse was a problem, but they can kind of stay um, uh, above the, above the game there, so they won't fall back into that trap. So there are many things that we do. Mm -hmm. All of these things, uh, church uh, ministries, they are things that churches should be doing. Um, mm -hmm. We learn how to church a lot. It's easy to learn how to church, uh, and once we learn how to do that well then, we, of course, we want to teach everybody else how to church, but working outside of the church, ministering to God's people, going out doing uh, what Matthew 28, 18, 19 tells us, go ye therefore, teach all nations. This, that's where the word began, the, those were the boots in the ground. And so, and, and, and even if we don't know exactly, that's what it. Is, we do what we can, and Jesus the Holy Spirit will help us find the resources that we need. Sometimes we only need a phone number or, or a word of encouragement. You know, call me if you need some help or, 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 or you can do it. You know, some motivation to help somebody. So, yeah, so there's many things you can do, many avenues there. All right. I think I've been given the, it's almost time to close out. So we have about three minutes. Tammy, give us an encouraging statement for our listening viewers. And then after Dr. King, I want you to do the same. And again, making sure I'm probably down to three minutes and I'll close it out. But I want to thank y'all for being on this panel. I want to thank uh, Howard University and I want to thank the participants that are listening. Tammy, what's your closing words of encouragement? We just got to learn how to look at one another and love one another without being judgmental. And we got to be able to eliminate, eradicate stigma. Very good. Dr. King. Be willing to go the extra mile to help somebody and empower somebody so they can do what God has called them to do. That's good. Pastor Ellison. Unmute. <laughs> There you go. If we would uh, apply a scripture, I would recommend Romans chapter three, uh -huh. uh, that some are all have sinned and are all short of the glory of God. And when we employ that broad brush over the work that we do, then no one is left out. If, we are the pastor have said the the, the the associate pastors have said the deacons are, and if you got AIDS or HIV, it, how you got it is not an issue. You need help. Amen. I can say this: right. love isn't love until you give it away. Amen. So whatever love Amen. God has gifted you to give away, I encourage you to be an advocate for truth be an advocate mm -hmm. for love and learn to master yourself your own biases because you never know the same finger that's pointing at you you got one pointing right back at yourself again my name is uh reverend sandy bailey gwen i am the executive director of foundations for living where we bring strength transformation to students, families, and community. Again, thank you, Howard University, for allowing us to be a part of this wonderful 11th annual conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank it was you a joy all. to be with you all. Same here. Same.